I'm Dean Sir. I'm with MLD Foundation. I'm co-founder and president of the organization. Well, we've certainly reached an inflection point. Um, Len Meldy was approved by the FDA March of 2024, uh, so we're just digesting that and figuring out, you know, as, as the corporate sponsor is, is commercializing the product, certainly a lot of uh, dynamics and changes there. Um, we're here at uh, World Orphan Drug Congress, which has a strong pricing reimbursement, access and reimbursement uh, thrust, and so there's a, a lot of activity going on with that. Um, the pricing of gene therapies is high. Uh, it's an expensive product because it's manufactured one-off for each of the patients. You've, it's, this is personalized medicine, uh, dealing with their genomics and the geno you know, the, the ideal gen the genomics we're trying to fix, so, so what are we repairing? Um, so we appreciate that it's expensive. It's also something that's very, very precise, so it's a limited number of sites. I believe the current plan is for five or six sites across the U.S. Those will be um, geographically dispersed and, and population density dispersed, um, and they've made some announcements on those locations. It's all good news, but it's still a challenge, still a lot of work to, to get where we need to. So this uh, having, having the drug approved, the ther therapy approved, being able to identify the patients, and of course then being able to get them across state lines, you know, talk about access and reimbursement. It's not just who's going to write the check, you know, be it a private payer or a public payer. Um, in many cases, uh, in, in half or more of the cases, we're anticipating that the families that will access this therapy are, are either already on Medicaid or will go on to Medicaid. And so going across state lines, moving state A's money to state B, and uh, certifying the, the doctors and the institution in state B, the, the, the state where the, the uh, center is, it's tricky. It's tricky. So uh, we have a lot of work to do, but it's all looking good for us. We, uh, you know, we, at least we know what cranks we're turning and, and what direction we're going. It is a huge milestone to have FDA approval and we've got EMA approval as well. But uh, the therapy is no good if we don't identify the patients pre-symptomatic and we've recognized that for, for a decade and a half and been working on uh, newborn screening. So we've got a, a wonderful screen, the assay, the actual test itself, very reliable, very re precise, very repeatable, low cost. Uh, we're now going through the process of, um, for the U.S., the federal RUSP uh, nomination, Recommended Uniform Screening Panel, which is a guideline for uh, states. Um, we were able to pass some legislation middle of last year, and our what, what we call RUSP-aligned states, or MLD RUSP-aligned, because most of them are RUSP-aligned, but uh, uh, we've got another one that's, that's, that's uh, obligated be, uh, to implement MLD. Uh, is just over 52% of the babies born in the U.S. That, that's a wonderful place to start. Uh, yeah, obviously, that says there's 48% to go, so there's a lot of, lot of work to do there. So it, it, there's the, the approval processes, there's the implement, implementation processes, and it, it'll take us a bit of time, you know, years. The RUSP, it's uh, part of HRSA, part of our, our federal uh, uh, policymakers. They do a very extensive evidence-based review. They want to make sure the therapy is good, that the screen is cost-effective, that it can be implemented, um, you know, reliably um, uh, and, and repeatedly. Uh, you go through this review process um, at the federal level, that takes about 18 months once you submit the nomination, or can take a maximum of 18 months, and that's pretty typical of what that period is. Then the states say, oh, you've got the federal government stamp of approval. Each of the states and the territories, and we've heard this, uh, I heard actually 10 territories and, and health organizations, and I'm actually much more aligned with that, so 60-ish different programs here in the United States. Um, uh, will see that recommendation and say, okay, it's time to consider this screen. And so they make their own decisions on uh, do they want to incorporate the screen, the screen. And for the most part, they will, but the question is how soon. And there are limitations in terms of equipment, um, uh, finances, just, just plain old cost of the test. And in many cases, uh, the state labs are having trouble getting enough con uh, employees and retaining those employees. Um, it, this is not a part of the government that, that pays extremely well. And so the people that get it, that have the passion for newborn screening, which across dozens and dozens of diseases, is very complicated. Each one of them is a little different, has subtleties in how they're doing the, the biochemistry and those sorts of things. And it's not, I mean, it certainly there's babies born every day, but, but you, don't, you don't get a, a rare patient every day. So, so the, the, 
the flow is, it takes a kind of a special person to be able to juggle all that and manage all that and, and appreciate the urgency when you do identify a potential positive, because that's the first step, and then there's a second tier in public health where they, they want to eliminate false positives, so they reduce, you don't want any false negatives, you want, you want to capture everybody that has the disorder. And so you tend to err on the false positive side, but you want that false positive to be really low because you don't want too many families going through this, oh, we think your baby might have something, you need to get an extra blood test or whatever and do the formal diagnostic confirmation. And that may take a week or two or three, and if there's genomics involved, it might take three or four weeks. And it's just another odyssey that, you know, for the most part, those, a false positive is a false positive, but you've run a family through that, that emotional trauma and they've got this beautiful baby who's not showing any symptoms. You know, none, virtually none of the babies with these rare diseases show any symptoms at birth, but they are able to detect that through the blood spot or, or other screening. So you don't, you don't wanna, you don't wanna disturb those families if, if, you, uh, if you don't have to. The flip side of that, from the rare disease side of it is, we need to make sure that a family, you know, a year or two down the road, depending upon the progression rate of the disease, isn't called up and said, oh, I'm sorry, I know you had newborn screening, but your child has this disorder. That's worse. These are rare diseases, right? So now the politics gets involved as to, well, you know, how, um, the, you know, we, in lots of areas of politics, we talk about the 1%, right? And, and that number may be less than 1%. But uh, the concerns for the false positives, we're actually struggling with the system to say, actually the concerns of the 0.001 or whatever it is that's the rate of newborn screening, that really needs to, it, it needs to have almost a higher weighting than the concerns of the false positive, because this is where it's really critical. You will get over the emotional trauma of a false positive. Um, we wish you didn't have to have that, but, but you will get over that. But the rare disease family, they won't get over it if they don't get detected and get access to therapy. With um, MLD and the gene therapy, if you are not pre-symptomatic, therapy's not gonna work. So it's just, it's black-white for us, it's critical. We are submitting our Rust nomination, hopefully in the next 60 days or so. Well, we've been blessed in, in at least one aspect of that. First off, like most places where you're climbing a mountain, if, as, you, as you see the mountain way in the, difference, in the distance, it doesn't look so tall. And as you get closer, it's kind of deceptive because there's that slow ramp at the beginning. And you go over the first hill and you see the next one, like, oh my goodness, now what am I gonna do? And, but, but seldom, not until you get to the very top, are they really, really steep. So you almost get lulled into it. But in the rare disease community, and certainly you know, my family, my wife and I, we are, we are so passionate about this, not for getting therapies approved, not for getting on the rust, but because it's a family journey and the community. Uh, the community is really what motivates us and, and our, our mission is we care, and the care is c.a.r.e. Compassion, awareness, research, and education. And it's not a coincidence that compassion comes first. When a family calls, uh, we were in our hotel room last night, when a family calls, We'll drop everything and, and help them wherever they are in this journey. Um, and uh, fam some families are well equipped, so, you know, can kind of process this. And but most certainly at the early diagnosis stage, they're just panicked. They don't they don't they don't know what information's true. They don't know who the smart, you know, the the, the, the best doctors are. Um, they don't know if their insurance is going to cover it. They're worried about their other family members. This is a genetic disease, and you know, they've learned a few things on Google, probably most of which just scare, scare the bejeevers out of them. And so we just know that's so important. Um, this, it is a journey. It's, you know, there's no, and even, even the families that will get now access to the commercial therapy. So in theory, you know, let's assume newborn screening's in place and, and of course the therapy's already in place. You get a newborn screen, um, you, you've, in theory, you're guided through the experts, and then we start to plan for the gene therapy. And after the gene therapy, and it's it's a medical procedure, right? So there's a process there. But uh, you know, a year or two down the road, in theory, everything is all smooth sailing, and that's what we've seen with the kids, the health of them. Um, you know, I, I tell people, says they're not they're not going to play major league soccer, but they might be on the B team. Right, so so they're. I mean, they're challenged a little bit. This this <laughs> is a, is another thing that we're as we're commercializing this. Pr we and I say we with a lowercase w because MLD Foundation is not commercializing. The the drug company is, but as this product becomes commercialized, 
um, the, the lives are dramatically changed for these children. But the parents have still gone through this trauma, and the baby's not going to remember the gene therapy. Um, they're, they're too young. But the parents are traumatized by this, and they, they and we want to believe that everything's going to be good forever. And the indications are exactly that, um, pre, if you're treated pre-symptomatically. But they remember. They remember that journey. And so there's going to be another whole um, type, or another, I don't want to say breed, but another whole type of of MLD family, which is the post-gene therapy family, that um, uh, is kind of like a cancer survivor, right? Uh, uh, it's another whole community that we're now starting to think about and say, well, how do, you, how do you nurture and care for them? They don't need as much care, but I think they need, they still need to be connected to people that have been on that same journey. They need the reassurance that somebody that got this therapy, I think our, the longest patient out is 12 or 13 years now. So somebody that got this therapy 12 or 13 years ago is still doing extraordinarily well. The person that gets the therapy tomorrow, those parents want to know that same thing. So we need to connect them. You know, we'll, we'll probably set up gatherings and, and I don't know, it'll be a formal conference or what it might be, but, but a way of, of supporting them as well. So it's, you talk about climbing mountains. I guess once you climb the mountain, you, it's maybe not as steep, but you, you come down the mountain, there's still, still mountain there. <laughs> it's just the, the backside of the mountain. So I, that's, that, you know, part of, part of us is, is looking at that as well. As we meet the families outside of the context of all of that, and we have because they at one time were newly diagnosed and had that sense of panic, and the internet is not the answer all. I mean, there's, there's a million answers on the internet, literally, when you, when you go query MLD. Um, we, um, we connect with those families, and we, we, again, back then, we were assuring them that gene therapy looked good. We've been involved with the animal back since the animal models, 2005-ish or so. This is a 20, 20-year journey for us. So early on, we were, we were assuring them of what had been done in the basic science in the bench. But now the kids, you know, almost, almost literally, and in some cases literally, are speaking for themselves. We had a PFDD meeting. Um, seems like it was two years ago, I guess. Yeah, it was two years ago, or a year and a half ago. Um, with the FDA and we actually had testimony at, par at that meeting uh, from children that are gene therapy uh, patients and they they were they were speaking uh, they showed some videos because you, you didn't it was a virtual meeting um, so we had to show videos but their kids that are out as, as I mentioned you know they're running and jumping and playing and dancing and and excelling in school you know I can look at a, at a child and say oh something because I'm, I'm so sensitized to this I can look at it and say oh that's that child's there's some deficit or something you know it's like some of your kids are smarter than the others or some can do athletics better or whatever I don't say smarter but they they grasp things more quickly um, so you can see those differences but they're gonna live normal lives they're gonna have normal social lives um, educational lives they will those children will become um, uh, productive citizens we hope in our economy get a job uh, pay taxes they will now support social services for that next generation of other rare diseases where they are, I don't know if they like us to call them consumers of social services, but they benefit from that. And we've, and we've talked about this in the value proposition of an expensive therapy. It, the analysis that's been done by ICER and NICE, uh, the two kind of external review organizations that are really value, looking at the value of a therapy, they take the cost of it, they take the benefit of it, they take how long uh, it takes to see that benefit, and they say, which way does the scale go? You know, if, if the price is way up here and the benefit is this, then that's not cost, that doesn't have high value. But if it's the opposite or even, then, then that's a, a good trade-off. They're looking at these children in, in the short term, like five, six, seven years, what would the alternative therapies or the alternative clinical support look like? And they're saying there's good value in this therapy. I'm looking at it saying 10, 20, 30 years down the road when we talk about these children or young adults or adults, and as I say, you know, paying taxes, contributing into society both because of the work they do but also the money that goes in, um, that's, a, that's a huge value. Uh, saving these kids is, uh, uh, and, and saving them in a way that doesn't just lock them into some level of, of lower quality of life but allows them to be all but normal 
is awesome. It's just awesome. Well, I think that, um, you know, as you acknowledged at the beginning, it, this is quite a journey. Um, I liken it to uh, being on a racetrack, and we've crossed the finish line, and everybody cheered, but now we go around for another lap, and more and more. And I think that, um, and it's a good thing we're driven uh, by passion and by personal connections, a lot of the advocacy leaders. Uh, and actually, a lot of the biopharma people were here with, with uh, other service providers in, in this uh, rare disease space. And they're driven, certainly they want to get paid, and I get that. But they're driven by a passion. The conference organizer uh, here uh, this year is brand new. I've, I've been working with her just on logistics and stuff, and she's connecting with the rare disease community in an extraordinary way because the stories are, they're so compelling they're so engaging and so it's it's an honor and a, a, a privilege and a, I guess a privilege I didn't really want but um, a, it's a privilege and, and a great experience to work with all these people that have that compassion uh, I appreciate what what you all do in, in helping to share that message I think the bigger picture uh, and, and the message I always want to give back and probably why I, I talk too much sometimes is that there is, there's a place for everybody here, and no one person really can do all of it. You have to collaborate, you've got to find good partners, um, you've got to uh, be there on the service side, or be there on the science side, or the, the pharma side, and be patient. As we were talking earlier about climbing that mountain, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gentle slopes in the beginning. Don't worry, you, you'll get to the mountain, uh, but right now you can do the next step and the next step and the next step. And um, there are people like me that are happy to help. Uh, we've seen a lot of success stories, but we need a, we need a lot more, and, and I just look forward to that.